on this edition of Great Lakes Now, bringing back a riverbank habitat in the middle of Chicago. You only got one earth. To really be a part of it and clean and help the environment is always the best. One county on the Lake Michigan shoreline is running out of water, and the race is on to protect a Lake Superior fishery from pollution from century-old mine tailings. It might be clogging up their spawning habitat, but it's also a chemical pollutant, so it might be toxic to the fish. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, even Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler. Welcome back to Great Lakes Now. At Chicago Shedd Aquarium, visitors can see fish and wildlife up close, including some from the Great Lakes. The aquarium staff also works in the field, researching wild animals and their habitats. Today, we bring you the story of one project that's right in the heart of the Windy City. The Shedd Aquarium's Kayak for Conservation program lets participants gather data and help protect one of Chicago's river habitats. Welcome to Kayak for Conservation. Um, obviously, this is a shed program where we're going to be taking you guys out on the Chicago River doing some paddling, but you guys are going to also be helping us out with uh, some really important scientific data collection and monitoring. I am a conservation stewardship facilitator at Shed Aquarium. Um, a big part of my job is uh, finding ways to get the public engaged in our public and natural areas in the Chicago area. So we're out here as part of Kayak for Conservation, which is uh, a Shed Aquarium program designed to get folks out um, on the Chicago River to collect really important data about the work that we're doing out here in terms of trying to bring back riverbank habitat. So my job is to get people out here to have fun, engage with the space, and then also collect valuable data that we can use to then study the way that the river is changing and hopefully uh, find ways to change it for the better. The kayaker's destination? Custom-built floating island habitats, installed by Shedd Aquarium and environmental nonprofit Urban Rivers. The islands host native plant species and are intended to welcome wildlife. The kayakers help monitor and maintain them, one of the things that we're asking our participants to collect out here uh, while we're on the river is trash data. So our participants are collecting that baseline data so that we can start looking at, for example, how much is in the river of any given type, whether that's maybe uh, cutlery, like food utensils, um, and then determining what are the best courses of action to actually prevent them from getting there in the first place. And hopefully, five, ten years down the line, we can look at what we've collected today and be able to compare that and say, we've made this kind of progress on the river. People don't really know what to expect, whether that's how much trash there is, or what kind of birds or turtles are around here. And so we have an opportunity to really show people down on the river, up close and personal, just what this river and this space has to offer. And more importantly, showing them if this is what it looks like now, this is what it could look like, giving them a vision and an idea of what an incredible space this can become. It's actually cleaner than what, it, than what we thought it was. The Chicago River, you don't think, beautiful, gorgeous flowers, scenery. You don't think, okay, these buildings is here, but they make the water look nice too. They all complement each other. So to really sit here and see it, it's like, it is beautiful. Bringing folks like the family today who are from Chicago out to the Chicago River is really incredible because they've lived their entire lives in this city and probably have never actually experienced the river this way or even thought a moment about it. So have, providing an opportunity for people to have that aha moment to really see things with a new fresh set of eyes is incredible. Now, I'm from Chicago. Um, we're all, well, my whole family is. It was really good and I could teach my brothers too like, hey, take care of where you live because you only got one earth, you know? And to really be a part of it and clean and help the environment is always the best. The kayakers aren't the only ones visiting the floating islands. At night, when the kayakers are gone, research biologist Austin Happel studies the island's effects on the fish population. Why at night? We'll get to that in a minute. I'm specifically sort of looking at how do these islands provide any benefit to organisms that are living within the waterways. So uh, I'm going out at night like I am tonight to look for larval fish to see if fish are spawning on those islands more than they are elsewhere or at least what times are they spawning and what fish are using this area. 
One thing about these floating islands is that most of the research that's been done, if not all the research that has been done, has been on nutrient abatement. They're really good at cleaning up waterways, but I can't find anything on what they do for biotic organisms. So it's really important to get some data on, are they providing zooplankton for fish to eat? Are fish hanging out around them? Are fish spawning on them? Over time, the Chicago River has been changed as the city grew up around it. For one thing, its flow was reversed. It's also been wrapped in steel walls, a far cry from natural riverbanks. So a lot of these urban waterways have sides or walls that are essentially made out of this sheet metal that's straight up and down. Um, and you can kind of think of it for fish as if it's like us walking down a city block where it's windy, things are blowing in your face, you can't really get any refuge from that wind. For fish, they can't really get any refuge from the current and they can't really find any habitat that they really like to hang out in, maybe feed off of, or spawn on. So one way of helping the area is putting in these floating wetlands. So these wetlands are made out of coconut core, they are held together with recycled plastic, and then we can plant native wetland plants on them. Their roots go down into the water and not only provide oxygen for the fish, but habitat for uh, zooplankton, which are essentially fish food, and then habitat for the fish. So the fish can eat off of them, and maybe spawn on top of those root masses. Happel is interested in whether fish are using the floating islands as spawning grounds, which is why he's on the river after dark. I'm going out at night to look for larval fish. We're going to be going out and setting gear called larval light traps. And these are traps that attract these uh, larval fish into them using light. So we'll actually crack a glow stick, put it in the trap, and the fish are attracted to it over the course of an hour, and then we'll pull it and see what we've caught. Each night Happel sets his traps, he gets insight into what fish are spawning in the area. So we just pulled in the first trap. I'm trying to kind of wash everything that's within this pan down to one area so I can get a sense of what is in here. And then I like to try to just see what I've caught. It looks like there's um, a scud in here, which is a type of freshwater shrimp. And then, yeah, there's a larval fish swimming around. The data Apple collects will be compared with historical data to paint a picture of how the river's spawning fish population is changing over time. I'm working with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Chicago to look at what fish are hanging out in this section of the river and how is that changing from before we put the islands in to now as we're building more and more islands and this project is growing. This is a highly urbanized area that we're trying to rejuvenate. So if we can see what fish are spawning here now, we might be able to see and track a difference in what fish are spawning as these islands build out and we get a larger uh, floating wetland mass in this area. So one thing our partners Urban Rivers is learning about them is how to actually put them in, how to maintain them, how long do they last, what are best practices, that way other cities can kind of emulate the project. Since the river's reverse, it's kind of difficult to talk about how this area might have a direct effect on Lake Michigan, but it's not like this couldn't be replicated in the Cuyahoga or in the Kalamazoo or in the Fox River or other rivers that flow directly into the Great Lakes. So this might end up being a model system that can help both clean up nutrients and provide fish habitat for other Great Lakes cities. Visit us at greatlakesnow.org for a map of other habitat restoration projects on the lakes. A groundwater shortage might be the last thing you'd expect to face on the shores of Lake Michigan, but that's just what people who live and farm in one Lakeshore County are dealing with. Partner station WGVU in Grand Rapids, Michigan brings us the story. You look at where we are situated, Ottawa County, of 30 plus miles of shoreline next to Lake Michigan. Water is ubiquitous here. We have a water problem. We thought it was isolated until we started to get the results back from the study. Ottawa County is located in West Michigan. More than 290,000 residents live here and they're wrestling with an expanding groundwater shortage. It was first revealed here at Highland Trails. The subdivision is the epicenter of the issue uh, in central Ottawa County that triggered the need for us to better understand what's happening underneath our feet with groundwater. When was that? When did that happen? It was in 2008. 
when we were notified of residents in this location at the subdivision who were running out of water. They woke up in the morning, turned on their faucets, and had no water coming out of the pipes. Paul Sachs is Ottawa County's Planning and Performance Improvement Director. He explains the groundwater wells had run dry. Allendale Township took emergency measures connecting Highland Trails to municipal lines drawn from Lake Michigan. It triggered a study conducted by Michigan State University and Michigan Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering exploring the county's geology and its two primary aquifers, the shallow and sandy glacial drift aquifer and the deeper Marshall bedrock aquifer. In this animation, the shift toward dark blue shows the decline in static water levels over the past 50 years. Look closely at the central parts of Ottawa County. These areas exhibit the most significant declines. Nearly 11,000 residential, industrial, and agricultural wells are depleting the aquifers. They were drilled into the Marshall Formation, and the Marshall Formation then was depleted because of all the people drawing from it. So if we have 40 houses doing 20 gallons a minute, what do we have? 40 times 20, we have 800 gallons a minute that is being drawn. That's a lot of water in an area that has only a couple acres. That's 24-7 year-round, compared with periodic farm irrigation spread over large swaths of land three months out of the year. John Yelich is the director of the Michigan Geological Survey at Western Michigan University. The geology here is very complex because it doesn't have an area where you can recharge rainwater coming in and recharging the aquifers. It's very limited. And that's what restricts how much water we really have. Whereas there are other parts of the state where we have enough rainfall, it recharges the aquifer and people are satisfied. But in parts of Ottawa County, the aquifer can't refill fast enough to meet the demand. There are too many areas of clay preventing snow melt and rain from soaking back in. The scientific findings were presented to Allendale Township at the epicenter of the challenges. And at the very end of that presentation, I asked the commission, do you have any questions? And there was silence in the room. There were jaws that were dropped. What was the big finding that caused that reaction? Our water levels are declining. They've declined 40 feet over the last 50 years, and it's not replenishing. Allendale Township is the fastest growing township in Ottawa County. It's also one of the fastest growing communities in the entire state of Michigan. When you are growing as a community and economic development and vibrancy is dependent on that growth and you find out that there's a water issue, that's gonna make you stop and think, what are we going to do moving forward? Allendale Township now requires every new development connect to municipal water and nearby in Olive Township, it's declared a moratorium on new housing developments using well water. The farming community is also under the gun Ottawa County is a state leader in agriculture production, and back in 2008, not far from Highland Trails, farmer Merle Langland had no shortage of well water for irrigating, but he was noticing his crops wilting and turning yellow. We had uh, underneath the pivot, the soybeans looked the worst, and it should have been the opposite where we irrigated, it should have been the best. So we got investigating, and yeah, there was uh, chloride in the, the water. We're a unique area, it's called the Michigan Basin, and it's essentially a bowl that essentially was seawater since 600 million years ago, and it all forms salty formations, and they all have salt water in them. As groundwater levels dropped, irrigation wells were drilled deeper, drawing briny water, damaging crops. The study revealed some of the more densely populated areas are experiencing a double whammy, declining groundwater levels and elevated groundwater salinity. So how to address the issue? There are municipal water lines pumping water from Lake Michigan, but with limited capacity. And there's two, there's Grand Rapids and there's Wyoming, and then Holland also has a small pipeline that's coming in from the lake. But remember, the water needs to be appropriated from the compact. And that, of course, includes Canada plus all the Great Lakes states. So in order to draw water out of it, you have to get approval from all of those, and then, then there's a cost. The cost estimate is over $100 million to put another pipeline in. What would the sources be to pay for that? I wouldn't even venture a guess. <laughs> I can't. And it's not just Ottawa County dealing with the problem. 
Armed with study results, Yelich and Sachs are on a mission to reshape water use habits before it's too late. With the help of community and business leaders, they're formulating a groundwater mitigation plan. It begins with an education campaign followed by initiating change. Water conservation, landscaping and irrigation, how we handle those things traditionally with green grass and uh, abundant irrigation, those practices need to change. Christina Kisner and her family moved to Highland Trails nearly six years ago. I think there's probably some things that the, the residents could do in terms of coming together and brainstorming and thinking about ways that we can help contribute to helping the problem. What we're looking at is that we have landscape that's not really taking advantage of the fact that we have a low water supply here. And we should be doing something to put zero scape, put things in that use less water. What is zero scape? Zero scape means substituting some of these grasses for rocks and other things that do not require any kind of water. Traditional development patterns can't continue. To have high density residential developments with small lots in areas that don't have municipal water but are need are dependent on groundwater shouldn't occur. We're also looking at overlay zones for land pattern development. There are areas of the county where there is recharge to that deep formation. We need to know where those areas are and we need to protect those areas for recharge. We just can't develop our land blindly knowing that there is a water resource concern. And the county is partnering with farmers too. We're working with the drain commission here in the county as an example of how we can pump the water out of the ditches, put it into ponds so that it can be effectively used for agriculture in local areas, but also how it can be put onto the fields as well. A number of years ago, we dug this pond and this catches all that water. The irrigator back there in the distance, that's what we use to uh, apply it to the field in in the summertime when we need it. How much water is here? Boy, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing this is good 10 million gallon. It's not for drinking, but it does the trick. A similar tactic can be applied in urban settings. Gray water is, say, the water from your dishwasher, your shower, your sink, your washing machine. You have a chance to route that water and reuse it. I understand, you know, we talk zero scaping and native landscaping. People have this desire for, for green, lush lawns and landscapes. Why use fresh drinking water for that? If things don't change, What's the outcome? We could have places that are not going to have groundwater for drinking water supplies. That's bad. People won't be able to sell their homes. That's the worst thing. You find out that you don't have it, they may have gotten a loan on it, but the value of the house has just gone down. That's right. So it's going to take really a punch in the gut for people to get this. And what we hope is, is that we don't have to do that. We're providing enough information and enough background after this six, seven year study that has been done. And the things that we're showing right now is that if we can serve and we do it, we can survive and everybody can be happy. For more on a region's groundwater, sometimes called the sixth Great Lake, visit greatlakesnow.org. In the mid 19th century, on the south shore of Lake Superior, the copper mining business was booming. But the waste from all that mining is threatening Lake Superior's trout and whitefish. Now, scientists and engineers are working to undo the damage. In the 19th and 20th centuries, immigrants flocked to Michigan's Upper Peninsula to work in copper and iron mines. The Keweenaw Peninsula became known as copper country, and it produced over 7 million metric tons of copper since the mid-1840s. Two copper mines in the towns of Mohawk and Wolverine sent trainloads of rock to mills in Gay, Michigan. There, the rock was crushed and the copper was extracted. The waste rock, known as tailings, or stamp sand, was then dumped into Lake Superior. As the rock moves through this mill, it's crushed to a smaller and smaller particle, and then it would separate out the sand from the copper. The copper was a heavier weight. And then the sand would be washed out of the mill, and, it, and with high volume of water, is sent out as a slurry into Lake Superior. Before the mills closed in 1932, they generated 22.7 million metric tons of stamp sand. Since then, wind and waves have been moving the stamp sands across the lake bottom and down the shoreline. 
Robert Regis is a geology professor at Northern Michigan University. His family has been coming to the area since he was a toddler, long enough for him to see dramatic changes. Probably in the early 70s, we started to see the black stamp sand migrating to this point right here. And every year from there on, the beach got wider and wider and wider. So in 30 to 40 years, the beach has grown to well over 100 meters in width and all of that thickness, uh, which equates to probably about 10 feet per year of you know width growth. The stamp sand is also drifting onto Buffalo Reef, an important spawning ground for fish. These Great Lakes reefs aren't made of coral, they're composed of rocks. And the spaces between those rocks are where spawning trout and whitefish want to drop their eggs. Lake trout and whitefish that are spawning in this area like very specific habitat. And by that I mean they prefer small cobble substrates about the size of sort of hard balls in terms of a baseball and a softball. Um, provides protection for incubating eggs, but they're also exposed to nice, cold, well-oxygenated water. And Buffalo Reef is a almost sort of very perfect spawning reef for lake trout and whitefish. And it's been a spawning reef basically since probably Lake Superior was formed roughly 15,000 years ago. And it's also one of the most productive reef habitats in Lake Superior for lake trout and whitefish. It's estimated that the Buffalo Reef fishery provides $4.5 million of revenue through commercial and recreational fishing every year. But fishermen in the area have already noticed a decline in their catch, and some have had to fish elsewhere. That's partly because the stamp sand can fill in the space between the rocks where fish want to have their eggs, but the sand is also a chemical pollutant. So it's still, relatively speaking, slightly enriched in copper relative to natural sands. And that sort of dual nature of this material as a contaminant poses two risks to spawning fish. Physical pollutant, it might be clogging up their spawning habitat, but it's also a chemical pollutant, so it might be toxic to the fish. Charles Kerfoot of Michigan Technological University has been studying the environmental effects of the Upper Peninsula's copper mining history for over a decade. You have to realize the concentrations of copper are really high. 1,500 parts per million of copper, where the state says 120 can have ecological effects. See, you're dealing with orders of magnitude here. Dr. Kerfoot and his team collect samples from the lake bottom around the reef. The jaws come in and scoop up a sample of the sand that, that's on the bottom, of the sediment that's on the bottom. And then we'll take it back and determine under the microscope uh, how many grains are stamp sand and how many are natural. It's a way for us to calculate copper concentration and potential toxicity. Dr. Kerfoot has shown a direct link between higher concentrations of stamp sands and fewer benthic organisms. These are the bottom feeding animals that fish rely on for food. By 50% stamp sands is very serious effect. By 75, it's a desert. There's just nothing down there. If nothing is done within 10 years, 60% of buffalo reef will be covered by stamp sands. That would be a disaster for those who depend on the fish of the Buffalo Reef, including the Keweenaw Bay Indian community, which has fought to secure federal funding to clean up Buffalo Reef. The Keweenaw Bay Indian community is a fishing community. It's part of our identity. The loss of that reef would be devastating to our community. If we lose that one, we'll be losing not only parts of the fish population that are here, but then we're losing all those connections to that area. It's not something that can't be replaced. Scientists and engineers are racing against the sand and Lake Superior's currents to try to save Buffalo Reef. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been working with local environmental scientists to figure out what to do with all the stamp sand. They're exploring several potential permanent solutions. But it will take time to determine which is the most feasible. In the meantime, they need to keep more stamp sand from drifting onto the reef and choking the Big Traverse Harbor. We're dredging uh, two different areas here in Lake Superior, one at the, at the harbor, the Grand Traverse uh, Harbor, and then the other area we're dredging is a, is a trough, uh, an old drowned riverbed that's adjacent to Buffalo Reef. If we can clear some of that sand out of the trough, the theory is that it'll buy us about three to five years of time as we develop a long-term solution to the problem. This has been a big endeavor. As a whole, this is important to everybody. It's been really um, good to see that so many people consider it to be important and so many agencies consider it important. 
It's a lot of energy. We're out here today touring the site. We're, there's a whole group of, uh, of various stakeholders here from not only the federal government, state government, tribal interests, uh, but the local university, Michigan Technological University. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that uh, have a passion to really, you know, ensure that this site uh, is remediated and, uh, and that, that the Buffalo Reef is saved. We're only uh, stewards of the land. We don't own the land. And other nations within here, the plant, animal, fish nations, they have rights too. And we always have to remember that we're borrowing from the future. And we want to make sure that our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren have the same opportunities in those relationships and connections that we do. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. Great Lakes Now is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Even Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you, thank you.